Hello, and welcome to SoVT Book Talk. I'm your host, Karen Simpson McVicker, and today in my co host chair, I am joined by Paige Vignola, who's the assistant director of the Manchester Community Library. Hi, Paige. Hi. Thanks for being here. I love coming into oh, this. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jess Hunsaker is on assignment at a bookseller convention out in Ohio, so we miss Jess, but we'll see her next month. Absolutely. I am super excited to announce our guest today. John Stephen Gurney is an illustrator and an author, and he grew up in Langhorne, Pennsylvania, reading Dr. Seuss books and watching Bugs Bunny cartoons. Yes. As he grew older, his reading material shifted to Mad Magazine and then to J.A.R. Tolkien, but he never stopped watching those Bugs Bunny cartoons. He studied illustration at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York, and received his MFA in illustration from the Hartford Art School. He teaches illustration at Hollins University in Virginia and Kutztown University in Pennsylvania. John loves visiting schools to talk about illustration. Since 2002, he has visited schools in 33 different states and five countries. Wow. And he lives in Brattleboro, Vermont <laughs> with his wife, Kathy. He, used, he has used more than 40 people from his town to pose as characters for his books, and he loves running and cycling, except when there's too much snow, in which case he cross-country skis and plays racquetball. Welcome to the show, John. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Thanks. Well, we are so excited to have you. We were saying that you're our first uh, children's author and definitely our first illustrator mm -hmm. on oh, the good. show. So we would just love to hear more about your work. Oh, sure. Well, uh, for most of my career, I've been illustrating books that other people have written. So a lot of those were series chapter books, like the A to Z Mysteries and the Bailey School Kids. So I think between those two series, that's probably about... I think it's more than 100 books wow. in related series. And, and the people posing um, was for those series. So I'd get, you know, I used to live in, in Brooklyn before I moved to Vermont. And, you know, we'd go to modeling agencies to get people to pose for book covers and, and they'd take the picture. But I moved to, you know, to Brattleboro and suddenly there's no, you know, I, I got to get real people off the street. And I remember we first moved there and I, need, I needed a second grade girl. And we were at this local fair and I'm like, oh, She'd be great. And I'm like, wait, I just can't go up to a random, you know. So I kind of <laughs> waited for uh, her mother to appear. And we've been friends with him ever since. Went to her wedding um, last summer. Oh, so my gosh. Great. So that was really a fun phase of my career was doing these covers uh, for, the, for those books. Um, and about 20 years ago, I wrote and illustrated my first picture book, Dinosaur Train. So this was fun. And this was based on my son, Jesse. He's kind of, you know, he was obsessed with trains and dinosaurs when he was little. So he, you know, it's like a fantasy about a train full of dinosaurs he gets to go on a ride on. And I switched to doing graphic novels about uh, maybe 10 years ago now. Um, and there's a series called Fuzzy Baseball. And this was the first one right here. And I think when I first wrote it, it was a picture book idea. And I was sending it out, getting rejected and stuff. And then I'd keep making changes. And um, as I was doing all these school visits, I kept noticing that in libraries, the graphic novel section kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm like, hey, maybe this could be a, a graphic novel. So I um, expanded it. I made it a graphic novel. It still got rejected, but it got like really nice rejection letters. So that was <laughs> always good. Um, and then finally, Paper Cuts uh, found the right home for it, and they, they published it. And um, you know, the first book is about uh, a character named Blossom Honey Possum, and she's the world's biggest Fernwood Valley fuzzy fan. You know, they're her favorite team, but they keep losing to the Red Claws. So she decides, instead of complaining about it, she's going to learn how to play baseball, and she's going to, you know, see if she can make a difference. So it's kind of about her first day on the team, and um, it's, you know, and since then I've done like four sequels, so I'm up to number five now. Um, and my goal with these books is to kind of, you mentioned Bugs Bunny earlier, kind of go for that audience, you know, like where kids enjoy it, but there's jokes in there they, the adults get that, that goes over the kid's head. Mm -hmm. or Even the, even the um, I try to think of, I remember my son like Calvin and Hobbes mm -hmm. when he was in second grade. And, you know, I know he, no second grader gets all the references in there, but they're still hilarious. So that, that's what I'm going for with, with these books is to have the imagery first or second grader just gets a kick out of looking at because they're funny animals doing silly things. Um, maybe the third, fourth graders get the plot a little bit and there's some baseball stuff going on and the adults get the, you know, the, the, the references and there's a lot of puns that with, with, the, with the character names. So it's fun, yeah. So the first one was, was Blossom's first day in the team 
and she's, uh, you know, it, it also helps kids understand like what a sacrifice fly is, what an error is. And then there's a little bit of a mind game between the relief pitcher named Fernando del Toro. And he tries to like figure out if this batter is going to swing or not. So it's kind of a little uh, kind of mental chess match going on there at the end. And the second book was Ninja Baseball Blast. And this one, they go to Sashimi City to play the, the Sashimi City Ninjas. And it's kind of just a buffet of Japanese tropes. Like there's so much that kids grow up with today that's in our society that they don't even realize came from Japan. I mean, the kaiju and the, you know, the Pokemon, everything's transforming. And um, uh, what's the other thing? Yeah, so it's just, it's just kind of a, a full of silly Japanese references. And it's kind of a homage, I think, to... Um, to, to the stuff and also I think a little bit about the cultural interplay because because the manga artists mm -hmm. they were influenced by you know Disney stuff right after World War II so there's always been that back and forth mm -hmm. so that's kind of fun and the third one RBI robots they play a team of robots so I figured not every kid's gonna like baseball so I'll get the ninja kids I'll get the robot <laughs> kids I'll get the you know dinosaur kids so um, yeah with RBI robots they play a team called the Geartown Clankies and I had fun with the names in here. There's like Ty Cog and Crank Aaron, and <laughs> Spark McPlier. And they, um, uh, yeah, w one thing I wanted to do, especially starting with this one, was I didn't want to always have the visiting team be villainous. You know, so in, in this one, especially, the robots are very nice. They're nice. They're not threatening. They're specially calibrated, so they can't, they can't be better than the fuzzies, but they can only be just as good. So the fuzzies, their strategy is if they just keep playing their best, they can outlast them because they're not allowed to recharge during the game. So the, the game ends up going all night and everyone's running out of power and everyone's falling asleep. And I always try in every book to have something to keep the kids wondering about. Like um, in, in this one, like Blossom has this fear of robots. See, there she is in the cover, like running away in terror. So she just has this irrational fear of robots. So it's like, is she going to overcome her fear of robots? Um, in Dino Hitters, they play a team of dinosaurs, so it's like, do the dinosaurs have any, or are their skills outdated? Do they have anything that the fuzzies can learn from? Um, in, in the fifth one, uh, this is a fuzzy baseball Halloween. This is a Halloween baseball book that just came out, and um, they're invited to play a team of kind of monsters, the Graveyard Gasleys, and the coach is, um, what's his name? Count Flapula, so he's a bat, you know, and he's got some ulterior motive. He talks about the big feast after the game. They're playing on Halloween, so there's this kind of like tension about what's going to happen after the game, and you know. So, and this, again, this has a lot of uh, the cliche Halloween characters come in. They're kind of monsters, but they're well, are they monsters? Are they just misunderstood, you know. So, mm -hmm. it's it's fun. I, I have a lot of fun with them, and I really um, I think now that there's five out, I think uh, people are beginning to mm -hmm. catch on and everything. So I know you've really enjoyed, you're really passionate about going into schools and talking about illustration. Can you share with us a little bit what you do when you go oh, sure, to a sure. school presentation? Um, well, I'll show slides. I talk about the process. I kind of adapt it for the age of the audience. So if it's, you know, I also say like when the younger, like kindergarten, first grade, it's nice to have smaller groups, you know, and you talk, you do more storytelling, mm -hmm. the images, and it's always pictures of funny animals too. So that's, that's always funny. But the older the audience gets, kind of the more it's about the process and the, the thinking that goes into it. And, um, you know, they, it, it's fun for them to see, like, photographs of people posing for the book cover and then how I change it. And then it's also really important for them to see, well, this is the first sketch. Then I worked with the editor. They wanted me to change that. So I did that. Then they wanted me to change that. So to emphasize that it's really a collaborative process mm -hmm. and also to emphasize that it doesn't come out perfect the first time because mm -hmm. kids don't want to change things and do it once. Oh, that's great. I want to touch it. You know, so I kind of draw and redraw and redraw over and over again. And I talk about the, uh, the, the inspiration for the stories and how I got my ideas and everything. It's always, always fun to hear. And then I always draw some, you know, it's always good to have a big pad of paper and, and do some, oh. some drawing. And if, if, when possible, if they can have clipboards with paper, I kind of lead them in some, mm -hmm. you know, some drawing activities and stuff. And you know, it's funny, at the end, I'll, I'll talk to them and say, what did you, you know, I think I tried to cover some important material about, you know, reading and comprehension and everything. And I'm like, what was your best part? And I'm like, I drew a monkey, you know. So that's, uh, it's fun to have something to take away that they, uh, that they drew. 
but you never know who you're inspiring. So you never know who's out there. That's know, true. In your audience. That yeah, they yeah. want to be an illustrator. And I think exposing children to those concepts of it doesn't come out perfectly mm -hmm. the first time, even though I get feedback. Oh, you have yeah, to yeah. change things. Mm -hmm. That's probably, mm -hmm. I think that's probably really powerful. Oh, sure. I think it definitely is. Yeah. So what's on the horizon for you? Another, another fuzzy baseball? Um, I don't. You know, I don't have an exact idea. I have a couple of germs that are floating around. They haven't coalesced yet. Um, but I, there's a picture book. I mean, I'd love to go back and do another picture book. So there's an idea that I'm, I'm shopping around right now. And then I have a couple other graphic novels that i um, debating whether to flesh out a little bit. The trouble with the, the graphic, I mean, I love doing the graphic novels, but there's just a lot of work. And, 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 and anything in publishing, there's like an inverse relationship between like how much creative freedom you get and how much you get paid. So it's like the more creative freedom, you know, so it's, it's a lot of work for a lot less money. Um, I mean, these books take about a year to do. Wow. They're, they're all color. And um, I think the last one might, because I'm also teaching full time. So it's kind of have to strategize when to get time to work on it and everything. Right. And so you're teaching from Brattleboro. Are you doing No, no, things? no. I drive down uh, to Goodson, drive okay, to Pennsylvania. Going to, so. going to Pennsylvania. Yeah. My, uh, I teach three classes a semester, and they're they're generally fit into four days. So I can leave here Monday morning, get there for a three o'clock class and a six o'clock class, and then um, the class ends at either six o'clock or three o'clock on Thursday. So I can come back, and I, I, my family's also in, my my father lives in Pennsylvania, so I can send, spend nice. weekends with him, and then my wife's up here. I'd love to spend time with her, and she's she's <laughs> still teaching in in uh, the Wyndham. Central School District. Okay. So she's, you know, so a little bit of a commuter, a little bit of a nomad, but I make it work. A lot of books on tape. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of podcasts. Good. That's great. So that's good. So what's your favorite part of the process? Like what's, what's the piece of it that you just love the most that lights you up? Um, I think, well, I love probably drawing the characters. I think that's kind of where almost all of it starts. Um, like with the with the robot one, um, you know, I just start doodling characters, and it's tricky. I mean, robots are anthropomorphic people, but this is a universe where everyone's animal, so it's got to look kind of like an animal person, you know. So just kind of, but to make it more complicated, when they arrive on the scene, they're in costumes because they're like hiding the fact that they're robots because they're not sure if it's kosher or not. So anyway. <laughs> So I have to design a, a robot that looks kind of like an animal, but also has a, a costume it can wear. So once I design the characters, then I kind of think about gags that the character could be involved with. It's almost like method acting. I get into the character's head and think about what situations. And then once I get the gags, try to string them together and get a plot out of it. And you know, try to just you know, you, you kind of want to. You don't want kids just to laugh you want them to kind of keep turning the pages and keep moving through the story so uh that's it's fun having it all come together you do you know? have a favorite character to draw um let's do, do, do would you ask a parent for the favorite child <laughs> that's an unfair question isn't yeah it? no no it definitely it's, a, it's like an ensemble you know i kind of think of uh, you know it's like a the, the team yeah, it's like an ensemble of actors that you're putting on this performance. And I'm like, oh, Walter Wombat doesn't have as much lines this time around. I got to get some, or you know, um, you know, Sandy Koufax. I need to get him in there. You know, so so that they all have personalities in my head that's kind of beyond what you get to see. But I try to like get it in there as much as possible. And and again, I, I feel bad when some books this one doesn't have the big part. Like uh, <laughs> you, next one, we'll get you. In, you know. <laughs> So, so. so I think I think you've provided us with some slides and illustrations we can put up here while you're talking. Okay, and sure. one of them will have your website. And is that the best way if there's a teacher out there, an art teacher or a school teacher who'd like to invite you to come, oh. is the best way to reach out to you through your website? Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. Website, johnstephengurney.com. And my Great. email address is there. Um, Great. Well, and I'm on Instagram and everything else. So thank you so much for coming oh, and sure. sharing Thanks. with us oh, today. This has been love talking. great. I love and that. I don't know if you have a minute to stick around. We're about to do our last now next segment sure, where we talk sure. about some of the books we've been reading. So we'd love for you to join in if you'd like to. Yeah, okay. sure. Awesome. Um, well, you know, because I'm driving, so I listen, you know. Yeah, that's uh, fine. We, and we I, talk about audiobooks. Okay, well, a couple going. I, I just I just finished Cloud Cuckoo Land. Oh, And I was yeah. just really blown away by that. Just, just the whole w way Door creates, mm. I mean, just 
depicts these other, you know, Constantinople and just different times and places. On top of that, making these stories in different times come together at the end. That, that was just really, uh, I really love that. And um, right now I'm reading, there's a graphic novel version of Sapiens. So I, I read oh. Sapiens, you know, when it came out a couple years ago. And it's, it's not the kind of book you think that would <laughs> make an easy transition to a graphic novel, but it's, um, it, it's, it's really fascinating. And it's, um, you know, I think he may, uh, you know, over, over glamorize the days of hunter gatherers, you know, <laughs> like actually the good life, but it's just, it's just really fascinating. It just gets you thinking about, that um, really cool. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, you know, the way what separates sapiens from the Neanderthals, the kind of how come we succeeded when our nearby cousins didn't quite make it. And he thinks it's mostly about our shared mythology and, and our mm -hmm. be able to cooperate like in vast, you know, groups and stuff. So mm -hmm. it's, 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 a, it's a pleasure and, and, the, and the illustrations are fun. And um, I'd also look at it and go, oh, so much work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you must have a very different perspective on yes. Oh yeah, no, you know, I used to, uh, when I was younger and go to a bookstore and see all these amazing books, be like, oh, so inspired. Now I go in and like, oh. So much work. <laughs> it's so good, ah. <laughs> you know, it changes things. Yeah, yeah, but no, there's always a lot of inspiration to, to look at. Yeah, well, thanks. All right, Paige, what have you well, been up to? What's next? Oh, do you have a next stuff? on your, do you have a next book? Oh, I just, you know what? I just started listening to David Copperfield because uh -oh. I heard it came up in conversation. I was like, you know, I never, never read that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I learned, I, you know, so I just started. It's it's off to a good start. Yes. You know? He's born, you know? <laughs> it's a strong start. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah. Go start somewhere. That's a good, yeah. that's a good place to begin. Yeah. All right, Paige. Uh, okay, so I've been a little bit all over the map. I love um, that. I tend to be a little all over the map. So um, recently, my children and I are very much into both uh, ridiculous puns and sci-fi. So uh, I picked up Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy again, which I hadn't read for years and years. Um, and um, you know, we always have a constant 42 jokes in my house because that is obviously the ultimate answer to the ultimate question of like the universe and everything. Um, so I was very excited to, to pick that up and kind of get a little bit of a fun read. It was a revisit for something that I have read probably, I'd say six or seven times in my life. Okay. Um, I have not made my way through the entire trilogy of five. I just have read the first book, uh, reread the first book again. Um, so that was my, my uh, last. Um, my now is, um, mm. I am, I'm also a bit of a, a Jane Austen junkie. I know sci-fi to Jane Austen is perhaps a little bit of a strange jump, uh, but I had picked up Persuasion thinking I had read everything Jane Austen, and I started reading this, and I'm like, I, I don't remember this. So if I have read it, I clearly was not paying attention, and I was too young to care about it. So I started rereading, hopefully, or reading Persuasion. Uh, I'm going to say hopefully reading it, not rereading it, because um, it would be really bad if I didn't remember That's that I had read it. A memory issue, novel. right. <laughs> yeah, um, and I'm, I'm really enjoying it, I have mm -hmm. to say. Uh, I, I always love uh, Jane Austen's characters. Yeah. So. Uh, and my next book is uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates' The Water Dancer. Um, now, I had the great fortune uh, a couple of years ago. I was a chaperone for one of my uh, school trips uh, to a People of Color conference, and Ta-Nehisi Coates was speaking at the conference, and it was amazing. Um, and at that point in time, I uh, picked up some of his nonfiction, and I started reading that. I didn't know that he had written a novel. Um, and so this is, it was fascinating to me to recognize that this is um, fiction that he has created. So this is, um, well, it's sitting right next to the bed where I'm going to be picking it up to read it, because that's, that's one of those... Um, Oh, I want to hear about that one. Yeah, I'm very excited about this book. Mm. Very excited about this one. Well, the last book I read was a cookbook, but I have been waiting for this one to come in at the North Shire because I had heard so much about the writer, Luetta Barrett um, Odin. So she grew up in Shawnee, Oklahoma, and one half of her family was uh, Native American um, Potawatomi, and the other half like came over on the Mayflower so very different sides, mm -hmm. very different influences. And then she was living in Santa Fe, and she has a restaurant that's combining sort of, she calls it inspired Native American cuisine, inspired first American cuisine. That's why first American, because it's got both sides. Huh. Mm -hmm. But also influenced by Santa Fe. So beautiful story about food and how she 
came to be a chef, and then incredible recipes. But I, you know, this is the time of year I always start thinking about my garden, you know, when it's like 18 out. And she has the most beautiful three sisters garden with corn and beans and squash. And I have been thinking about planting a three sisters garden for a while. So now reading this, I'm like, okay, I'm definitely planting a three sisters garden. So I really, I highly recommend it. And some great recipes, simple. Like it's not complicated. A lot of great vegetarian recipes in here. So it's a beautiful book, highly recommend. And next, well, next, I guess now for me, I haven't actually cracked the cover, but this is now. Uh, my book group chose The Heaven and Earth Grocery Store by James McBride. and Everybody's asking for that in the library. I know. I can't wait for the list. I'm of super excited. So I can't talk about it much yet because I haven't actually started it, but I will maybe today. Uh, but I am super, super excited and glad that we, I think this will be a great book club pick. And then my next uh just on, I'm in a lot of online, you know, book groups following, and people are just going bananas over *The Frozen River* by Ariel Lawton. And this is set in Maine in the late 1700s, and is, I guess, based on real diary entries from a midwife, um, and about there's a murder, and just lots of things going on, and and. People have just been, I mean, a lot of people are saying it's their favorite book of 2023. So yeah. I'm really, I'm just like so excited. I just need to make more time to read. <laughs> so that's the trick right there. It yeah. is the <laughs> trick, though. I'm doing better lately. I've been read a lot of books so far uh, in 2024. So I'm really, I'm on a good track. Yo, cool. Do you keep track of how many books you read in a year? No. Do you keep track? No. <laughs> I'm keeping track this year, so we'll see how I do. Well, I usually have I do. three or four going at a time. So I... And one, this doesn't include, I'm always listening to one, too. Mm -hmm. So I just finished listening to Go as a River. Oh, oh, my gosh, what a beautiful book. So sad, though, listening and crying. <laughs> um, and now I just start, I'm starting First Lie Wins. So we'll see what that's Yeah, I just, I mean, before... Uh... Crook Cloud Cuckoo Land. I uh, listened to that one. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, and it takes place where I teach in I was Kutztown. Say it's in Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah, Pottstown is kind of next, right next door. And it's some awesome. of the teachers from Pottstown. So it's a. Uh, That's great. I, I haven't quizzed them yet on <laughs> their experience versus the book, but it was a great book. Great. I really, I loved yeah, it. I'm really looking forward to it. Well, John, thank you again. Thanks so much for being here with us. Oh, sure, sure. My pleasure. Us. It was an and, honor. And again, we'll have John's website up if anybody wants to get in touch with him about coming and doing a presentation or have any questions. Sure, sure. Again, thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you both. Since Jess isn't with us this month, I'm going to cover some of the upcoming events at Northshire Bookstore in Manchester. Saturday, March 9th at 6 p.m., Anna Quinlan will be in Ooh. conversation with Joe Donahue of WAMC and Northeast Public Radio on After Annie at the Southern Vermont Arts Center. Amy Bloom, author of In Love, calls After Annie a wise and heartfelt novel of connection, of loss and love, and the power of both. So you'll definitely want to look for that, and that will probably be a ticketed event, I would imagine. Oh, thank you. Then on Friday, March 29th at 6 p.m., Maggie Thrash will be in conversation with the Northshire bookseller, Bethany Marsfelder, talking about Rainbow Black, a brilliant, deliriously entertaining novel, part murder mystery, part gay international fugitive love story, all addictive, searing, high-octane triumph. Sounds really exciting. That does sound exciting. And then Saturday, March 30th at 11 a.m., there will be a play date with Sandra Magusman and an Easter Bunny story hour featuring Sandra's newest line of books, Let's Play. This is a new interactive board book series focused on simple childhood games that help young children hit key developmental milestones. Mm -hmm. So those are three great events coming up at the Northshire Bookstore. And now I know Paige has a lot of events to talk about coming up at the Manchester Community Library, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, we, we always do have a, quite a bit going on. So the first thing that I'm really excited to talk about is that Taconic Music is coming back for their International Voices Part 2. So back in October, Taconic Music brought the community an awe-inspiring literary and musical event, uh, which was um, individuals from around the Northshire community who have international backgrounds, and they were reading pieces of poetry in their native language, and then a translation of the piece of poetry into English, and Taconic chamber players paired that with music from the area. Um, and that was so popular, and people enjoyed it so much that Taconic has uh, done 
a part two. And part two is going to be taking place on Saturday, March 2nd from 2 to 4 p.m. Um, it's not ticketed. Everybody is welcome. So uh, come on down to the library and, uh, and participate in this phenomenal event. Um, the second thing is uh, during the school day, um, the library is really excited about the upcoming eclipse. And so we've been kind of doing some programming to sort of build into that. And we have a presenter who uh, calls himself Dino Man, and Dino Man has a space program. So on March 7th, we're doing two different performances. At 9.30 in the morning is for the younger kids, and at 12.30 is for the older kids. This is really kind of geared more towards elementary school level. Um, but uh, we've got kids from Mems and Maple Street and Dorset and everybody coming. Uh, but if you happen to be home with your own little ones or if you're a homeschooler and you want to come, that's, that's the time. So the description that uh, Dr. gives us about his, uh, his uh, presentation is through the solar system and beyond is exactly where Dino Man takes his audience in this fast-paced exploration of the heavens. The eight classical planets are visited and investigated, as well as Pluto, gravity, and the incredible cold of space. Dino Man space uses dinosaurs, meteors, comets, liquid air, and a goldfish to give students a truly unique view of the heavens. So I am absolutely intrigued. I can't wait to, uh, to watch that one. Um, completely shifting gears. The next gallery event that we have coming up in the library is um, a, a project that is actually a, a collaboration between Vermont Humanities and the Museum of Chinese in America. And the exhibit is called Responses, Asian American Voices Resisting the Tides of Racism. And that's going to open on March 8th. And we're going to have a gallery event from 5 to 7 PM on March 8th. Uh, so Responses originated at the MoCA Museum in New York in 2021 and was conceived of as an offering to our communities in a moment of crisis. Chinese and Asian Americans were being blamed as the genesis of the coronavirus and targeted in assaults across the country, harming their bodies as well as their sense of belonging. So to help us navigate what was happening, this exhibition explored the lessons of history and raised a collective voice against the rising tide of anti-Asian hate and violence. So this is a fascinating uh, um, a gallery exhibition. I'm very excited for it to be in the building. It's going to be here from March 8th until April 19th. Okay. Um, and Vermont Humanities is actually offering um, uh, uh, monies to schools who are interested in applying for grants to come visit uh, and, and uh, investigate the exhibit. Um, and this is also part of um, the uh, Vermont Humanities Vermont Reads series, um, which is in conjunction with the book, the Vermont Reads book this year, which is Last Night at the Telegraph Club. So there's a lot with, uh, okay. with that in itself. Um, a couple of other events we've got sort of bringing into spring. We're partnering up with uh, the Green Mountain Club for the first one is the Stratton Fire Tower, which is on March 14th from 6 to 7 p.m. So for 50 years, 50 years, Hugh and Jean Jaudry kept watch over Vermont's Stratton Mountain working as fire lookouts. So if you come to the library on March 14th, you're going to listen to them telling stories about the fire tower and you know the various different adventures that they had up on the mountain as people were hiking the long trail. Uh, that was sort of a, a passing point. Um, and uh, it, they became caretakers for the Green Mountain Club itself. Um, and uh, Hugh and Jean have such a, a fondness for the Green Mountain Club that they're asking that if anybody is interested in coming to the event, they also consider donating to the Green Mountain Club. Um, and then the other event in uh, conjunction with the Green Mountain Club is maintaining the long trail. And that's on March 16th, which is a Saturday. And it's going to be at 11 AM. Um, and we have Lauren Courier, who is coming in from the Green Mountain Club uh, in order to be able to talk about the years that the club has evolved and how it maintains roughly 500 miles of trail in Vermont, um, including 74 backcountry campsites on the Appalachian Trail. Um, so there are working trails, and it's a dynamic process in order to be able to adapt to changes in the, okay. in the use of the trails. And he's going to be talking about really what it takes to keep this incredible resource that, uh, that we have. And it's in our backyard. We probably don't even think about it. And people who are traveling from Georgia all the way up right. uh, coming through every summer. So it should be a really interesting discussion uh, on that particular day. And then two other things we've got going on. One is uh, we're having a selfie portraits workshop. It's actually gonna be at the same day, March 16th, but it's at one o'clock. Okay. Um, and if you're not quite satisfied with the way that your selfies come out, I know I never am, um, local artist Trish Weil is gonna be uh, doing a workshop on how to make the fabulous selfies, what angles, what lighting. Okay. And how, she, knows, she knows how to make it work. If you've ever looked at her Instagram account, you know she doesn't have a bad picture out there. Um, so that's gonna be taking place on Saturday, March 16th at one o'clock. And last but not least, um, 
back in January, um, the library began a, a series once a month of uh, cultural diversity potluck uh, events. This was brought by uh, community organizers who wanted to get this going. We just had our last one actually last night. And with the next one is going to be March 21st, and it's from 5 to 7 p.m. So this is a family-friendly potluck, and it's intended to celebrate the BIPOC community. It brings families together in a safe, loving, and supportive environment. You get to meet your neighbors, find support, share resources, speak on community issues and opportunities, and absolutely have fun. Um, the gathering features a, a monthly hair clinic. It's free to families. Donations are obviously always welcome. Um, there are speakers and artists and face painters. And uh, if anybody is willing and, will and able to, bring a dish. And we're striving for a cultural cuisine. Fantastic. You're a Whew. busy lady. <laughs> busy place. And that's Fantastic. March. <laughs> well, and spring will be coming next time we get together. We'll certainly be thinking about it. Absolutely. That's exciting. Well, thank you so much for being here, for sitting in the blue chair today. It's exciting. Uh, we, I, I miss Jess for sure, I but know, it was exciting being Jess, here. But I think Jess will be back with us next month. Fabulous. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time, happy reading.